Thank you, Frank, and good morning, everyone. We appreciate you joining us today for our question and answer session on our second quarter results. I hope everyone had time to review our press release, listen to the prepared remarks, and view our presentation materials, which were made available this morning on our investor relations website. It's important to note that in our Q&A session, we may make forward-looking statements that are based on management's current views and assumptions, including facts and assumptions related to the potential impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on our results in fiscal 21. Please refer to this morning's press release for factors that could impact forward-looking statements and for reconciliations of non-GAAP information, which may be discussed on today's call. Uh, I'm here virtually with Jeff Harmoning, our chairman and CEO, Kofi Bruce, our CFO, and John Nudy, group president of our North America retail segment. Uh, we are in different locations, so we will uh, make sure that technology works well for us and everything goes smoothly. And with that, uh, let's go ahead and get to the first question. Frank, you can get us started. Thank you. Once again, to register a question, please press the one four on your telephone. You will hear a three-tone prompt to acknowledge your request. If your question has been answered and you would like to withdraw your registration, please press the one followed by the three. Our first question comes from Ken Goldman with JP Morgan. Please proceed. Hi, good morning, thank you. Um, two for me, if I can. First, quickly, um, the trade load of pet food was this to catch up from under shipments in prior quarters, or was this in advance in advance of what could be, you know, maybe an undershipment next quarter, or maybe just heightened demand? I'm just trying to get a sense of, you know, what this means for your third quarter since you didn't call it out as a headwind. So thanks, Ken. So first, I would, you know, I would start with saying we had a tremendous quarter in uh, in pet food in general, and a really good first half of the year. And I think we've proven that despite the fact that we've lapped our food, drug, and mass expansion, that we can continue to grow this brand. As it relates to the the topic of how how we shipped uh, relative to demand, I was saying the first quarter of this year we shipped behind demand. Recall our growth, our reported growth was six percent, even though our movement was probably in high single digits. There were a little bit of a reverse in the second quarter where. Our reported net sales growth was 18%, but our, our movement was probably in the double digit range. How I think about it for the first half of the year then, our reported net sales are up about 13%. Our, our movement's probably up about 10, I would say, maybe 11, but probably about 10 or 11%. So we have shipped a little bit ahead of movement as it, as it pertains to this, um, this year. I would still expect us to have a strong quarter in the third quarter and our movement to remain strong. We'll see what the reported net sales impact is, but I would expect our shipments to be uh, to be strong and our movement to continue to be strong because what we're seeing in the category right now is mid single digit growth really led by premiumization and because Blue Buffalo is the, the best brand in that and the biggest brand in that segment, uh, we're performing well. Thanks. And then my follow up, you know, you're guiding to a flat EBIT margin year on year uh, in the third quarter. But in 3Q20, you know, you did have a pretty big hit from COVID in China. I think you said at the time that just haagen China alone was 150 basis point headwind to your total uh, operating profit margin in the quarter. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong on that. Um, and, that, and you know, you had organic sales growth that quarter of 0%, which was pretty low for you guys, so there was no fixed cost leverage. You know, you turn around a year later, China's doing great. You have all this fixed cost leverage from another 7% organic growth quarter coming. Why shouldn't we be modeling an EBIT margin you know, maybe a little bit higher than that 16.2-ish percent number you did a year ago at this time. Sure. Yeah, Ken, you're Ken, right. uh, yeah. Go ahead, Kofi. Go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, sorry, Ken. Uh, Kofi here. Uh, thanks for the question. You know, as, as, as we uh, mentioned in the prepared remarks, uh, one of the things we're flagging is an expectation that we will see um, some of the external supply chain costs shift into to Q3, which will be an offset to um, some of the expected leverage benefit we would we would expect to see with the volume that we're guiding to for the for the quarter. Great, thank you. Our next question comes from Andrew Lazar with Barclays. Please proceed. Good morning, everybody. Morning. Good morning, Andrew. Hey, good um, morning. Jeff, in, in um, your repair, prepared remarks, you, know, you called out, and I think you did last quarter too, but you called out some interesting results in, in China where traffic in the company's retail shops is, is coming back towards normal levels, but sales of at-home consumption items, you know, like Wanchai Ferry, still remain quite elevated. So, you know, of course, every market is, is not like for like, but 
you know, do you see the dynamic in markets like China and others, or maybe Australia, that are well ahead of where we are in sort of getting the virus under control as, you know, reasonable indicators or corollaries for some of what perhaps gives you a little more comfort and why there's conviction in some of the at-home items staying elevated, even as things kind of normalize here in the U.S. I'm trying to get a sense of, you know, what, what takeaways you can conclude from some of those markets as it relates to the U.S. Yeah, Andrew, that's a, it's a very good question and, and also a good memory from what we talked about in Q, Q1. I mean, we, I put these in my prepared remarks because there's a lot of speculation among us as, as CPG people in food, as well as investors and analysts about what's going to happen post-pandemic, and uh, we're all looking forward to that day. Uh, but there are very few data points on what is actually happening when, uh, when governments aren't locking down um, restaurants and bars and things like that. And so one of the things we can't, there are a couple data points we can point to that don't guarantee what's going to happen afterward, but at least there are data points of what's actually happened rather than speculation on what might happen. And one of those places is China, where restrictions have been lifted five or six months ago, and we're still seeing slight declines in our food service business, while our Wan Chai Ferry Dumplings business, which is a frozen business at home, remains up double digits. And while it's not up as high as it was at the beginning of the pandemic, it's still up, it's still up uh, double digits and significantly above where it was pre-pandemic. And we think that's important because at the very minimum, what it points to is the consumer eating habits, while they, while they may change from where they are now, once we have a vaccine and once we're post-pandemic, doesn't necessarily mean they're going to go all the way back to where they were before or at a minimum aren't going to go back as fast. We're seeing a little bit of the same thing in Australia, where our, you know, our current movement in Australia is not what it was at the beginning of the pandemic when they were on a lockdown. But we have seen growth in our business in Australia, um, even in the last few months as restrictions have been eased. And so we, we, point the, we point these things out, and I point these things out, because while there's a lot of speculation about what might happen, there are at least a couple places where we're watching what is happening, and that would point to continued levels of pretty high demand even once we're, uh, we have a vaccine and once the lockdown and restrictions have been lifted. Got it. Great. Now, thanks for that. And then just quickly, you discussed not yet having had the opportunity to kind of fully replenish retail inventories in a lot of areas as, you know, consumptions remain pretty elevated. Um, would you anticipate more of that retail inventory refill to be able to happen in fiscal second half such that, you know, sales maybe broadly, we call it in North America retail, could be ahead of in-market consumption? Or are we still at a place where, you know, significant refill of inventories at retail is, is just tough given where consumption levels remain? Thanks so much. Yeah, Andrew, let me start by let me start with this question. I'm going to pass it to John Nudie for specifics on North America retail. I would say in general for this quarter, as I look at our whole enterprise, we really haven't built inventories in the second quarter, but it really does depend on the segment. So for example, we talked a little bit about PET, where we we redid ship ahead of demand and refilled pipeline. In, in consumer convenience and food service, it's the opposite, where because of school closings and all the rest, we, we certain distributors aren't carrying as much inventory, and we probably are a little bit, our, our, our RNS is behind demand, you know, for the quarter. And in North America retail, you know, because our movement was about 9% and our shipments were about 9%, we saw very little movement. But maybe it would be helpful for John Newdy to kind of weigh in on, on um, maybe what we saw in Q4 last year and Q1 and two, and then you know, kind of what the implications are for the rest of the year. Great. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. And uh, hi, Andrew. In terms of uh, North America retail, um, we did ship in Q4 of fiscal 20 about nine points. Um, uh, shipments lagged consumption by about nine points. As we moved through the first half of fiscal 21, we were able to replenish about four points of that gap. So there's still about five points to make up, and we do believe by the end of the fiscal year we'll get there. Um, the majority of our categories were actually in pretty good shape from a capacity standpoint, a service standpoint, but we have a few uh, that we're still uh, have some significant issues with, uh, things like soup and dessert mixes, uh, Old El Paso taco shells. We do uh, believe we'll get better through Q3, and by the end of Q4, I think we'll be back to where we want to be from an inventory standpoint. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Our next question comes from Laurent Grandet with Guggenheim. Please proceed. Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, good morning. Good morning. Do, yeah, good morning. I do have some questions on, on pet food. So, wet pet food was plus 25% in the quarter, treats at plus 40. With the addition of test, test tool and uh, wet cat food, I mean, what to expect? I mean, uh, for wet pet food, I mean, uh, I mean, this coming uh, Canada year. 
And, and also, I think you said in the past that you would be launching new treats at the beginning of, of the calendar year. Could you please update us uh, on this initiative, please? Thanks. So, uh, Laurent, as I, as I think about our, our pet food business, I mean, one of the things I'm most pleased with is that we're growing across our different segments. So if you look at it by product types, if you've got a, a dog food, whether it's wet dog food or dry dog food or dog treats, we're growing in all those segments. If you look at cat food, whether it's dry or wet or treats, we're growing in all those segments. Then if we look across channels, we're actually growing across all the channels we participate, participate in. We're growing in the food, drug, and mass channel. We're growing in, we're, we're actually returned to slight growth in specialty, and we're actually growing quite a bit in, um, in e-commerce. And so I think that speaks to the underlying health of our, of our pet food business when we can grow in all the different segments, whether it's consumer segments or whether it's um, in the channels we compete in. When it comes to, you know, how we're going to grow forward, I mean, certainly the premiumization of pet food and the humanization of pet food is a trend we see coming. Um, we're, we're really excited about this tasteful launch. And um, it's a pet, cat, wet food is a is a five billion dollar segment, and uh, we probably have about a two or two and a half share of that segment. Whereas our dog dry is, is ten shares. So uh, we have a lot of we have a lot of ground to make up. And what we're introducing to the marketplace is going to taste great. And we know that that pet parents of cats, you know, they want to feed their cats something wholesome and natural. But they also need it to taste good because, frankly, cats are picky eaters, and certainly they can be. And so we're excited about that. When it comes to treats, we are we do have some treat launches lined up here for the third quarter. So we're, we're launching those as well. We also have some more innovation in our pipeline, both on treats and in, uh, in the cat food area. And so we're, we're, uh, we're pretty bullish about uh, our, our ability to continue to compete effectively given what we see in our innovation pipeline and, frankly, the continued premiumization and humanization in the pet food category. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, and if I may, I've got a second question on Europe. Sales are improving in Europe, uh, and you mentioned uh, in your pre remarks, I mean, all in Paso and Agendas, uh, being a major you know, element of that, uh, the, that the recovery. So now, actually, we, we saw also trends improving in yogurt. Uh, could you please I mean, provide us I mean, uh, some more business update about uh, that significant piece of, uh, of your European business? Yeah, so I'm uh, really pleased with our European results. I mean, we, we grew share in, broadly in France, we grew share in Australia, and we held share in the UK, so our, our European business is doing well. The things that led to growth, as you say, are our haagen business and our Old El Paso business, which have good margins, which is why you see our profitability um, up in the quarter, outpacing our, uh, our sales growth. But our, but our yogurt business, particularly in France, um, continues to grow. I'm really pleased with the performance of our French yogurt business. Um, we're growing share, but we're also growing in the absolute. We're just not growing as fast as we are in haagen and in um, Old El Paso, but we are growing our yogurt business, particularly in France. In fact, our yogurt business um, throughout the world, with the exception of the U.K., where we, where we uh, discontinued a, a subline in, in adult yogurt outside of the U.K., whether it's Canada, whether it's the U.S., whether it's France, our biggest markets, we're actually growing our market share in yogurt, and um, so we feel good about our performance there. Thanks, guys, and uh, happy and safe holidays for you. Thank you. Uh, same for you. Our next question comes from Alexia Howard with Bernstein. Please proceed. Hello there. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Just huh? fine. Good morning, everyone. Um, so, sticking with the European theme, I, I can't help but notice that uh, in the U.S. retail segment, You've obviously got very robust takeaway and would expect, given the pandemic, things are, are going very strongly there. Europe looks kind of more normal. Um, you know, the, the sales growth is more subdued. I'm just wondering structurally what, what the differences are between the two markets and why we would, would be seeing things out through the pandemic so differently between the two regions. Yeah, it's a very fair question, Alexa. Let me try to unpack it for you, because and and it's a fair question. When you look at our retail sales in Europe during the quarter, they were up 11 percent. When you look at our retail sales in the U.S., they're up 9 percent. So actually, if you look at retail sales of branded products, what we're seeing in Europe is very similar to what we're seeing in the U.S. Now we have some product portfolio differences, like a big yogurt business in Europe and it's smaller in the U.S., but we're seeing our retail growth about the same. Remember, though, that as you look at our results for Europe, 
Um, our European business also contains a, a reasonable sized food service business. So think about haagen shops and uh, our food service dough business, which are not contained in our North America retail businesses. Also, we have some, we have some other businesses um, that we bought um, with yogurt and with dough and other things, some, and corn, some private label businesses, which are not also growing not as fast, which obviously we don't have in the U.S. So if you look at strictly retail to retail, I would say Europe and the U.S. are behaving quite similarly, but we have some other businesses in Europe that would overlap into the food service area and a little bit of private label that drags down the overall sales result, but with still good profitability in Europe. Very helpful, thank you. Uh, and then yeah. as a follow-up, commercial activity, uh, obviously that was pulled back on in the early part of the pandemic. Just curious about whether commercial activity, particularly in the West, uh, is coming back. Are uh, the retailers expecting you to spend back a little bit more than you normally would do um, because they want some of that money back that wasn't spent earlier in the year? Uh, Let talk about those dynamics and then I'll pass it on. Thank you very much. So I like to this is Jeff Seaman. I, I think I heard promotional activity in our retailers looking for us to, to spend back or spend more incrementally. I think that it was a bit choppy, but I think that was the question. Yeah, John, do you want to you want to pick up on that? Yeah, absolutely. So for uh, the U.S. in particular and Canada as well, we're seeing less promotional activity uh, really through the first half of our year. Uh, it's primarily driven by a decrease in depth of promotion. So frequency looks pretty similar across the majority of our categories. Um, but again, promo uh, promo frequency is down in capacity constraint categories, though. So again, it's really a category by category uh, dynamic that's going on. Things like soup, uh, we chose to pull a significant amount of merchandising really through our first half to make sure that we had product available as we get into key season. Desserts would be the same thing as well. So as we move to the back half, we think in the majority of our categories, you're going to see uh, promotion levels normalize versus uh, you know what we've seen prior to the pandemic. Uh, I think we'll still see lower levels of depth of uh, discount in some of the uh, categories that are capacity constrained. And I'll tell you, again, it's a balancing act. Obviously, uh, we want to be competitive. Our retailers want to be competitive. But I think everyone wants to do it profitably as well. So it's a dynamic discussion that's going on with our retail partners uh, and something we'll continue to assess as we move through the back half of the year. Great. Thank you very much. I'll pass it on. Thank you. Our next question comes from Robert Moscow with Credit Suisse. Please proceed. Uh, hi, uh, I had a couple of questions. Uh, uh, Jeff, the, the first one was on e-commerce. You know, I've seen some predictions that e-commerce could be as much as 20 to 25 percent of the grocery industry over time, and I think that's based on the investments that the retailers are making and the expectation that consumers enjoy. Um, getting the convenience during the pandemic. Can you talk a little broadly about how your business model might change if that becomes that big of a, of a, of a penetration? Uh, or does not much have to change? We just have to kind of keep up with retailers' demand. So, Rob, let me uh, I'll provide a little backstroke perspective, and then we can talk about what happens in the future. I mean, eight, 18, 18 months ago, about 5% of our business globally was through e-commerce. And uh, in 18 months, it's now jumped to 10%, so it's doubled over that period of time. So pretty significant change in a short period of time. And uh, that is certainly true um, of our U.S. business, but it's also true of what we're seeing in China and Korea and Europe as well. So it's a, you know, it's a fairly global phenomenon. As far as where it goes, I mean, I, I guess the, the other historical perspective I would also provide is at this point in time, even though 10% of our business is through e-commerce channels, at least here in the, particularly here in the U.S., our biggest business, about 85% of those sales actually go through store still. And that's important because up until this point in time, we certainly haven't had to change our model very much um, because most of our e-commerce sales still go through stores. And grocery stores here in the U.S. are haagen shops in China, and so our model hasn't changed much. I don't think over the coming couple of years, our model is going to be is, is going to change very much because the click and collect model, where consumers pick things up themselves, is so much more profitable for our retail partners that that model I think is going to be a still be a predominant one in the near future. How it looks five years from now, I mean, we'll see. I do think that e-commerce will continue to grow. I think it'll continue to evolve. But I would tell you, at least in the near term. I think we're very well positioned. We over-index in our categories because we've got great brands and we've got really good capabilities. 
and um, and the business model for us is not very different than uh, than what we've seen before. Okay, great. And a, and a follow up for you, different different subject. A lot of us are trying to figure out the cost profile of the industry getting into fiscal 22, and I would imagine some cost that you had related to COVID uh, mitigation of plants will come down. Is there any way to broadly think about your cost profile, um, you know, like a year from now, and, and what costs might come out, and maybe even comment on on other efficiencies that you're looking at? Kofi, you want to you want to tackle that one? Uh, a absolutely, and uh, I'll try to try to steer clear of getting too deep into fiscal 22, given uh, a, a, a humble respect for the uncertainty of the environment we've got right in front of us. But I think uh, I think you have the general structure right. There are certainly costs uh, that we have have been bearing as we deal with um, some of the health and uh, safety uh, protocols to support um, safe operation in this environment. Some of those could potentially uh, go away, but I think the other and more important is, as you think about the operational costs um, that we're incurring to, to service higher levels of demand, um, the way that we have pursued supplementing our capacity allows us to scale down um, to the extent that uh, demand comes off its peak, even if uh, even if it remains elevated. So I think we've We've left ourselves with agility um, to not build uh, a lot of these costs into our, our structure. Uh, so I think that's the posture we've taken as we've we've looked at how to service demand in this environment. Great. Thank you. You bet. Our next question comes from uh, Brian Spillane with Bank of America. Please proceed. Hey, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> um, my question is, um, you know, if, if we're if you go into a scenario where demand remains elevated, you know, for the next few years, um, <clears throat> if we look at North American retail and the mix of business now, you know, like meals and baking has really driven a lot of the growth, um, or the extra growth, I should say. Um, would you expect the mix to change? So if we kind of transition to kind of a, a, you know, a newer normal where, there's more flexibility, people working at home, and we're kind of past the pandemic. Pandemic. I'm just trying to understand whether or not you think the mix of, of what's driving the growth in North America retail would change going forward, or do you think that things like meals and baking would continue to stay at, at, at elevated levels? <laughs> that's a, that, Brian, that's a that's a good question and, and an important one, and one that, I, to be honest, we're trying to, we're trying to figure out the next quarter and what our mix is going to look like. I would I will tell you though that. Um, what I what I do see is that there are there's certainly a lot more people who have been introduced to baking. We know that household penetration has especially increased among uh, young families, and especially uh, among uh, Hispanic families. And so we know that people have baked more, and they're going to be more confident in baking, which would point to you know perhaps um, baking remaining elevated to the extent that people work from home. That would speak to the breakfast occasion, the lunch occasion as occasions that will, you know, have the opportunity to benefit longer term. And so it is possible that our mix changes. We'll have to see when we get there. You know, what I what I what I like is that our our meals and baking businesses here in the US are uh, the margins are really good on those as they are in cereal. And so to the extent the mix changes, um, you know, I think we'll we would still have an opportunity to grow profitably. And so um, Clearly, we're all we're all interested to see what's going to happen in F22 and beyond. It's a little bit early to call, but I am confident that should we see a change in mix, that we can navigate in a way that we can produce, you know, hopefully produce some growth, but also maintain profitability as we do it. All right. Thank Thanks, you, Jeff. Have a great holiday, everyone. You too. Our next question comes from David Palmer with Evercore ISI. Please proceed. Uh, thanks. Good morning. I wanted to talk about reinvestment in growth. I know it's a broad topic. It could be advertising. It could be other capabilities. But how are you thinking about that? Uh, obviously, you have opportunity to do that this year, even stretching back to fiscal 4Q of last year. But how? Wh which, what is the level of that reinvestment uh, in, 20, in fiscal 21? And what is that supporting in any color would be helpful? And I have a quick follow-up. Kofi, you want to take that one? Sure. 
just let me uh, frame out, a, you know, as you look at, uh, in particular, some of the brand building activity uh, uh, activity that, that you would look at through media, we're, we're up um, roughly double double digits through, through the first half in terms of support behind key platforms um, and key ideas. Uh, we do continue to watch uh, with, with a hawkish eye the, uh, the return on investment on, on those uh, brand building activities. And uh, I think the, the capabilities, as you think about those in particular, uh, data and analytics, those, are, those are, are coming through in our admin line. I would expect those to be investments that have a, have a, a payoff profile probably over the intermediate term. Um, so this is really about setting up a sustainability of some of the, the growth trends and, and being able to ensure that we have a good shot at holding on to some of the penetration gains that we're seeing in this environment. You know, I, I think the, um, there's a, almost a cynicism or a skepticism out there and for people watching the food space. Uh, they, they see the food companies, and, and Mills was uh, part of this, uh, they cut back on advertising spending during much of the 2010s, and there's going to be this reinvestment now. But I think that the, the, the concern or the expectation is that maybe advertising doesn't work for these categories or it didn't doesn't work like it used to. Are you doing things differently in the way that you're reinvesting now that you feel like the ROIs will be better and, and any color there would be helpful? Thanks. Yeah, David. Yeah, I read your report and uh, I don't agree with all of it, but but uh, but I respect the fact that you, you put out there what you think. You know, we've measured ROIs for a long time, and we think we're pretty good at it. And uh, if you're asking whether advertising has changed over time, the answer is, of course, it has, uh, because there are, there are no longer three channels in the TV set. I mean, you can you can advertise in a variety of formats, whether it's through gaming or Instagram or Hulu or what have you. And so, of course, advertising has changed in terms of how people consume media. What hasn't changed, though, is what is what drives ROI. What drives ROI is um, marketing behind big brands on really good ideas that people care about, like heart health on Cheerios, like uh, Jennifer Lopez uh, marketing YoPlay and Calcium on, um, on yogurt, um, in places where people are going to watch it. So, you know, we advertise Totino's um, through gaming because that's where people are, are um, that's where their eyes are, and, and that's where they're going on Totino's. Advertising Honey Nut Cheerios heart health on gaming probably wouldn't be the best idea. And so those are the things that the things that I mentioned, big brands, great ideas that people care about and where you put it, that's actually remained the same. What's changed is that where people go for information. And so we're, we're following that just as everybody else is. What I think is different and probably underappreciated about what we have is we have a lot of first party data through BettyCrocker.com and Pillsbury.com and, um, and box tops. And when we combine what we can do with that through data and analytics, along with um, great brands and really good ideas, we're confident that we can generate good ROIs. Great, thank you. Yeah. Our next question comes from Faiza Alwi with Deutsche Bank. Please proceed. Yes, yes, hi, good morning. So a couple of questions um, around topics that have already been discussed a little bit. Um, the first one is just, Kofi, around margins. Um, I was hoping that you could help quantify sort of some of the puts and takes um, on the gross margin line. And I think in 4Q, you had said that you had incurred around $100 million of COVID-related costs. Um, and you talked about those extending into fiscal 21. So I was wondering if we could, if you could, you know, quantify how much of those have extended, um, and how much of these might stay sort of post-pandemic, um, and you know maybe there has been, you know, some benefit from internal operating leverage. I know we've talked about lower promotions. Maybe there's some positive mix because some of your higher margin categories um, have been growing faster. Um, and, you know, raw materials seem to have raw material pricing. There's been some favorability there. But I was hoping you could just unpack some of these factors um, and, um, you know, what you've seen in the first half and, again, how we should think about those factors in, in a more normalized environment. Sure, sure. Let me, uh, let me just give you a sense here that uh, the, the kind of the, the, in order of magnitude, the way to think about the 
the cost structure on gross margin. Uh, we are expecting about 3% input cost inflation and continue to track to, to roughly that. Uh, our higher operational costs to service uh, service demand in this environment, which is, is one of the categories that we would have flagged as being linked to the pandemic, um, would follow that. And then brand capabilities and investments and then the health and safety costs also were linked uh, to the pandemic. You know, I think candidly, uh, it, it is getting harder to separate the, the COVID-related costs that we have we have, if have, have not been doing so um, this year, in part because uh, it, COVID is, it impacts um, and permeates so many areas of our business, and there, there, there probably is a, a level of visibility that, that is hard to get um, much more granular than we have been. Uh, I, I think you're right um, in, in the call about uh, mix of business, uh, certainly uh, leverage. Uh, those things um, certainly help uh, help the margin profile as we're seeing a lot of growth on our, our highest margin businesses in, in pet um, and uh, North America retail, driving a lot of the company's growth um, and that accreting to, to gross margin mix. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And then just a follow up. I think, Jeff, you mentioned in your prepared remarks that you have sort of incremental flexibility around bolt on M&A and share repurchases at the right time. And I was hoping you could expand on that. Um, so are you waiting for the pandemic to, um, you know, essentially go away before you take some actions around on the M&A front? Um, are you more active in the M&A market than you were maybe a year ago? Um, I know you'd previously talked about, you know, some type of portfolio optimization or some divestments. Um, and, you know, are there any particular categories um, where you would maybe like to expand in? Um, so, you know, just, just, just more color around those topics. Sure. Let me let me answer it kind of top line, and then Kofi, if you want to come in and, and answer anything in more detail, please feel please feel free to jump in. You know, I would say as we as we think about capital allocation, you know, obviously the first call is to the business, and uh, you know we've increased our capital spending this year behind some nice growth projects, especially in cereal and fruit snacks and and uh, Mexican food. Um, the second thing we said we would do is, you know, once we got our leverage down was to, to increase our dividend, and we've increased our dividend rate by 4% so far this year, so we've done that. And so then it begs the question, you know, what's, what's going to happen going forward? You know, the, the first thing I would tell you is that, you know, we, we would hope to get to a more, what we would consider to be more normal capital allocation process now that our net debt to EBITDA ratio is in about the 2.9 range. And so it gives us a lot of flexibility, a lot of different ways that we can create value for shareholders. Um, if we see some, we'll continue to reshape our portfolio, and that's both on the acquisition front and the divestiture front. And so to the extent we see bolt-on acquisitions that we think will be accretive to our growth and good for shareholders, we now have the flexibility to do that. If, on the other hand, there's, there's nothing that we see on the horizon on the M&A front, we now have the, the flexibility to, to buy back shares if we need to do that. Uh, we don't need to necessarily wait for the end of the pandemic before we do either M&A or share buybacks, but now we have the flexibility on our balance sheet to, to resume those kind of activities and to create value for shareholders in a variety of ways, which we feel great about. And I think we've proven through M&A and Blue Buffalo that we can add value through M&A, and clearly share buybacks are something that can, can add value as well. So that would, be the, that would be the top line. Kofi, anything you want to add to that? No, I, I think we continue to be very pleased with the uh, the uh, progress we're making on de debt deleverage, and and so I think as we look at that uh, as as uh, as the gate that that probably most matters, um, we are very quickly getting back to a place where our capital structure is in the 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 right long term target zone, and then I would just also add that we do have an existing share repurchase plan with a fair amount of authorization remaining. Um, up and standing, so there really isn't um, any 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 additional gate should we decide that uh, share repurchases make sense. Perfect. Thank you so much. You bet. Our next question comes from Jason English with Goldman Sachs. Please proceed. Hey, good morning, folks. Congrats on another strong quarter. Thank hey, you. Bye. Um, it's just, I guess I want to come back to the gross margin question, and, and I apologize. I got a little bit distracted by 
by, by my son in the middle of your answer. So you, you may have actually commented on this, but um, <laughs> uh, you, you, I think I heard you in response, maybe to Ken Goldman's question on terms of margins um, going to flat next quarter, mention external cost shifting into next yes. quarter. Um, so I guess how do external costs shift? Um, I would think that they, they're, they're just kind of there if you're using external providers. Uh, and yeah. it, are you effectively the big lead that if, if there are going to be gross margins, does that stall out the margin progression as we go into next quarter? Uh, uh, Jason, I, I totally get the uh, the interruption from uh, from your your, your son. Um, I've, I've had them even on investor calls, so I I, I totally get it. Uh, thanks for your question. Uh, yeah. So as you think about uh, next quarter. The, the way to think about external supply chain cost shifting is that um, we, we were able to service um, more of our demand uh, through internal capacity in Q2. Uh, we, we didn't need to rely as much on it, but as we go into Q3 we, uh, with, with an expectation of, of demand remaining elevated and recognizing and linking to the fact that we we didn't see as much inventory replenishment in, in North America retail. We would expect to have to lean more heavily on external supply chain in, in Q3 um, as we, we expect to make some progress against uh, against that inventory rebuild. Um, the other component to your point, um, so most of that would come at gross margin. There would be uh, potentially some additional costs that come through um, at the admin line as we as we advance uh, some, some of the investment in capability. Thanks, that's helpful. And one more quick question on pet food. First, congrats on the strong results of that. They, they certainly surprised me. Um, uh, more robust than I was expecting. Can you give me a performance by channel? Like, how are you doing on e-column versus pet specialty versus what we see in the Nielsen measure channels? Hey, Pardon me, we're trying to reach uh, Mr. Seaman back. Can you, can you hear? This is John Eddy. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? John, you're there. I, I think I even heard Jeff still talking. I think you all are on. Oh. I can't, I can't hear Jeff. Uh, we're trying to reach uh, Jeff back. Thank you. Kofi, you want to take a crack at that answer? Yeah, yeah, sorry. I uh, just want to make sure. Am I st I'm still on. So uh, question was kind of by channel. As you as, as we look at uh, our Q2, uh, I, we, we, we saw, you know, pet specialty probably uh, lagging the other two channels. Uh, E-commerce up uh, double digits uh, as, as we look at the, the shape of our business. That's about a third of our, our, our sales in, in pet. Um, and FDM at, um, at at almost uh, forty percent as we as we look at the measured. Got it. It's forty percent FDM. Got it. Thank you. I appreciate it. Be the pass it on, and hopefully we get Jeff back soon. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, sorry about that. And we're back. Okay, Frank, we can go ahead with the next question. Our next question comes from David Driscoll with DD Research. Please proceed. All right, great. Thanks a lot, and glad you guys are back. So I wanted to ask you a little bit more about pet food. Uh, Jeff, when, when you bought the business, it, there was guidance from the old team at double-digit top-line growth. When it became part of General Mills, you stuck with that double-digit guidance. But there was just enormous skepticism on the ability of, of that business as part of General Mills to keep going. I think in your answer to one of the first questions, you said underlying demand is running 10, 11 percent. Are we uh, are you able to say that that blue has some runway here to continue to see that double digit growth? And then can you just give us you've mentioned a bunch of things so far in the script, but can you just kind of hone in on some of the pieces here? that would give us that double digit growth for, you know, sometime into the future. And, and what I like about this particular question is I hope this is not a pandemic related question and that you guys do have some, 
you know, very clear thoughts about it because it's, as I think you guys have said yourself, the pets don't eat at restaurants. So hopefully that, that makes sense. And then I've got a follow up, please. Yeah. I, I, um, first let me, let me go with what I, what I know. And then we can talk about what we think, you know, what, what I know is that the, the growth in blue Buffalo really isn't pandemic related. And, and even though, you know, anecdotally, um, adoptions are up for pets and certainly among millennials, that's actually was not driving the growth of the category and it's not driving the growth of blue Buffalo. The category is being driven by the premiumization of pet food. And we know that because the dollar growth is up mid single digits in the category and the pounds are only up low single digits. So that Delta continues to be, uh, to be important as pet parents switch from whatever they're feeding their pets before into more premium pet food. And so that's what we that's what we know, and we know that Blue Buffalo is a is a great brand. You know, we also we also thought when we bought Blue Buffalo that we'd be able to execute well with our rollout to F, the food drug drug and mass channel because we'd done it with Annie's, and we got a lot right. We got a few things wrong, but we we learned a lot through Annie's, and so we were able to apply that to Blue Buffalo. And so um, now we've got a really good all channels business. And one of the things we learned with Annie's was that great brands travel across channels, and that just because you have something in a in a uh, grocery store, it doesn't mean that every consumer knows that it's there yet. It takes a long time to, to gain awareness. There are some places we've looked, we probably only have 20% awareness in some accounts that the Blue Buffalo actually exists at that supermarket chain. And so um, that has given us confidence, not only that we could execute a food, drug, and mass rollout, but that Blue Buffalo would be good across channels and that we continue to grow even once we gain full distribution because we've seen this movie before on, on Annie's, and that's what's playing out. As to how we grow into the future, I, I can't promise that we're going to grow double digits in the future. We had a very good quarter this quarter. I think we'll have a good quarter coming up. But um, what I can tell you is that I am confident we have the, the best premium brand in, in, the, uh, in the pet category. I'm confident that the premiumization of pet food will continue so that we're very well positioned. Um, we have a robust pipeline of renovation and, uh, and new products and that we can continue to grow in food, drug, and mass. And so all those things um, lead me to believe that not only has been Blue Buffalo been a good acquisition for General Mills, but that it will continue to perform well. And whether that's high single digits or double digits will remain to be seen. But um, I think that we're all, we were all confident when we bought Blue Buffalo that we could do a lot of good things with this business, and um, we're at least as confident now as we were the day that we bought it three years ago. Well, you certainly get – Big congratulations from me on the performance here. We've seen other businesses at other companies struggle, so good job on that one. My follow-up question is on staying with pet, is on the marketing model. Blue used to have a really sizable investment in in-store promoters, the so-called pet detectives. And on top of this, the brand had industry-leading levels of advertising. How has that changed with the pandemic and the pressures that we've seen on pet specialty stores? You know, it is it, you know, fundamentally, have, have you shifted monies from those in-store promoters to the to the advertising side? Is the total budget down? I just have lost sight of that a little bit and, and, and like to understand how you're going to keep, you know, kind of your foot on the gas pedal on this business going forward. Yeah, so the the yeah, the, uh, the pandemic changed a lot of things, including the ability of consumers to get into stores. The what I will say is that what hasn't changed for Blue Buffalo and what will not will not change going forward is our commitment to keep educating pet parents on the value of Blue Buffalo. And as you say, there was there was there has been a huge in-store model to that um, historically, and we wouldn't see get necessarily getting away from an in-store model, but we've begun to supplement that with not not only with TV advertising but also digital advertising, digital marketing. And so what I think you'll see, is, what you'll see is our dedication to growing the brand and growing our marketing will continue. How that marketing, that marketing mix will change over time. And we think that an omni-channel approach to marketing where you have some in-store presence, but you can also meet pet parents where they are one-on-one -on -one online is going to be an increasingly important, important part of, um, of our business. And we've done a really good job with North America Retail in that regard. And we're applying some of what we learned into PET and, um, and plowing some new ground. We'll probably talk about that even more maybe a quarter from now. But I, it's, a, it's a really good question. What I can tell you is that the marketing model will continue to evolve as our ways of reaching pet's parents evolve, but our dedication to building the brand will remain unchanged. Appreciate the thoughts. I'll pass it along. Thank you. 
Our next question comes from Rob Dickerson with Jeffries. Please proceed. Uh, great, thank you. Um, Jeff, maybe just a, a kind of a you know broader question, just around you know the the strength of brands, right? And uh, I guess more specifically, your brands and the market share you've been able to hold or take uh, within the U.S. really over you know the past nine months, um, kind of vis-a-vis -vis private label, right? There's been a lot of discussion and you know, why private label has maybe lagged, you know, some of these uh, stronger brands or master brands up front, it seems like it may have been, you know, supply chain issue. It would seem like the supply chain issue maybe has kind of drifted a little bit, uh, speaks more broadly and positively to, to brands overall. But then at the same time, you know, we hear companies saying, okay, well, you know, uh, if we go into a recession, consumers will, you know, continue to look uh, to consume food at home because it's, you know, less, off the option, um, but also sounds like you're suggesting they still won't go to private label. So I'm just <laughs> trying to, you know, kind of right size, you know, how, <laughs> how how we should be thinking about brands overall with respect to kind of the economic backdrop uh, and then kind of compared to private label. Sorry, that's, there's a lot there, but thanks. <laughs> there, there's a lot there because there is a lot there. I, well, you know, what I would say is that, let, let me go back to the last great recession because I was actually marketing during that. The um, the first thing I would say is that you know anytime you see economic turmoil, um, the first shift that consumers have toward value is actually not to private label. The first shift really is away from from away from home eating to at home eating, because the economics of eating for, at home are a lot more favorable for consumers than the economics of eating away from home. So that's the first big shift that takes place. So you see the categories grow. Then, you know, within that, you know, what we saw within our categories during the, during the last Great Recession, we actually held share through the Great Recession. Private label actually grew as well. Private label actually grew share. And, and where, we saw, where we saw the share losses was from middling brands. And so, the, you, know, that is, you know, that's one of the things we saw during the last Great Recession. What we've seen now is that in, in the categories in which we compete, not only here in the U.S., but in Europe and Brazil as well, is that we continue to gain market share because we've got good brand strength as well as good su supply chains. Our, our retail customers see that we're driving growth in the majority of our categories, and they want to see that growth continue. And at least so far, we've seen private label shares decline, whether it's in pet food or human food or, um, or even in Europe. And so, you know, what we, you know, then the question is what, what comes forward, and we don't see any reason why consumers won't continue to buy big brands. They may, consumers may decide to shift to more to private label, but if, if what happens during the last Great Recession happens again in our categories, we'll at least hold share during that, during that period of time. So that's, I mean, I, I, I like to try to get back to what has happened because everyone likes to speculate about what will happen, and, um, and, and I do too, but I think it's instructive always to go back and look to see what has happened. Okay, fair enough. And then just um, kind of a follow-up question that's related. You know, obviously, really over the past five years, right, there's been an incremental push into ongoing SKU optimization. That's just kind of, you know, it's kind of nature of the beast uh, always. Uh, seems like there's been maybe a little bit of an acceleration or kind of pull forward, you know, of that. Uh, just given everything that's been kind of at hand over the past nine months, let's call it. Um, do, you, do you kind of feel that, you know, when you speak with the retailers that they're really, you know, increasingly focused on those high velocity, kind of more scale, more profitable items, um, such that, you know, kind of those larger brands still kind of have the advantage relative to some smaller brands trying to kind of eke in Right. Uh, while, you know, uh, obviously there are a lot more moving parts now than there may normally be. And that's it. Thanks. John, you want to take this one? Yeah, sure, Rob. Um, a couple of things. I mean, I, I think uh, the variety of SKUs really um, needs to be looked at category by category. So as you know, we discount, or we put on hold a significant number of uh, soup SKUs as we uh, uh, went into the pandemic. And what we learned was uh, some of those we can do without, but some of them are important because variety matters to consumers. So you have to start with the consumer and really understand what they're looking for. The broader trend that we're seeing, though, uh, particularly with retailers, and Jeff mentioned that 85% of e-commerce is click and collect. 
So those orders are being fulfilled from the shelf. And for the retailers to really be efficient and run the shelf well, uh, both for their customers coming in as well as the customers driving through, uh, they are moving to fewer SKUs on the shelf with higher velocity. And for us, uh, we think that plays well for our brands. Our brands tend to be number, number one or number two in the category. We've been focused on building our brands. And this is the third or fourth consecutive year in a row in North America retail where we've grown share uh, in the majority of our categories. So we think we're set up well for the dynamic that's going to play out in the shelf in the future. All right, great. And happy holidays. Thank you. You too, Rob. Thank you, Rob. All right, Frank, I think that's, uh, we're, unfortunately, I know we didn't, we weren't able to get to everybody on the queue, um, but, uh, but I think we're going to, we're going to wrap it up here um, and uh, wish everybody uh, a very safe and healthy uh, holiday. Uh, thanks for spending your time. I appreciate the interest in General Mills and we'll be in touch soon.